my name is Dr. Ethel Tungohan. I am a, an associate professor at the Department of Politics, and I will be your host for this event. So let's get started. I'd like to start by recognizing that I am giving this presentation here in Toronto. The area known as Tacaranto has been taken care of by the Ashnabic Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I also wanted to take this opportunity to reflect on how I, as a settler, can contribute to the ongoing work of decolonization. Over the past few years, I'm learning more about my relationship to the land. Recent forest fires and climate catastrophes all around us show that we cannot take the land for granted, and I'm learning more about how I can more fully support Indigenous land back movements. Given that this talk is being given in an academic space, one of the eff other efforts I am part of is trying to center Indigenous knowledges in my teaching. To that end, one research one resource I'd like to share with all of you is a syllabus created by the Canadian Political Science Association's Reconciliation Committee, which is chaired by Dr. Joyce Green. And I'm going to put that in the chat box after I finish my preliminary remarks. Uh, so I'd also like to take this opportunity to first thank York Center for Asian Research and the Global Labor Research Center, and in particular, Alicia Filipovich and Hadra Murwali for their support for this event. And I'd now like to quickly go over ground rules for our discussion today. We are going to hear from Dr. Tanya Dasgupta first, who will share brief remarks about her book. And after that, we're going to hear from our panelists who will share their reflections on the book as well. There will be an opportunity for audience members to ask questions, which I encourage audience members to share either in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Uh, and once we have uh, time for Q&A, I will read out loud the questions uh, for Professor Desgupta to answer. Um, please note, as I've mentioned already, but for those of you coming late, that this talk is also being recorded. Now, before we move on to our speakers, one more thing. Uh, this fantastic book <laughs> that we're honoring today, Twice Migrated, Twice Displaced, is available at the UBC Press website for 50% off until March 28th. Just enter the promo code TWICE50 at the checkout, and I think Alicia will be putting in the details in the chat box as well. Oh, and I'm also being told there is free shipping for orders over $40, um, and these details are also in the chat box. And now let's shine the spotlight on Professor Tanya Desgupta, who will share with us brief remarks about her book. Welcome, Tanya, and congratulations. Thank you so much, Ethel. I must say that I'm just truly honored today to be with all of you uh, here, the panelists, of course, uh, yourself, Margaret. Uh, I, I do use your, your work all the time in my research, in my teaching. And I'm really looking forward to also hearing from Alicia and Harshita. Um, you know, I want to, you are at the cutting edge of uh, scholarship on diaspora and race and gender. And I really want to, uh, really excited to hear about what you have to say about my work. I do want to also thank Alicia um, for, for co-organizing this event. Uh, you're just amazing. And I also want to thank Ethel uh, for even thinking of this book launch. And, you know, uh, it's because of you that I, I thought of, you know, I thought of it and, and agreed to do it. So I'm truly grateful. And thank you all very much for, for coming and also um, for all your warm wishes, which I read uh, in the chat. I'm not very good at replying very quickly, so you have to forgive me. But I see it all, and I'm really... Um, it's very heartwarming uh, to see this kind of response. So quickly to, to talk about the book, the book is about Gulf South Asians in Canada. And these are South Asians, specifically Indian and Pakistani migrants who come to Canada through various Gulf countries. And Gulf countries meaning countries like Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and so on. I think I, there are six countries. Um, and it was in, um, 
so it's 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 quite a unusual uh, group of South Asians um, that's now part of the Canadian South Asian uh, diaspora. And it was in 2004 or so that I started um, noticing that there were significant numbers of, of these migrants in Toronto, which is where, where I am. And I was very curious about this group. And I wondered you know, why they had come through this different pathway. Uh, so it was really a personal interest which triggered this, uh, this research. Um, you know, I was really curious. I myself am, am a first generation immigrant. I came here with my parents. I came as a teenager and we had followed a direct route to Canada. And so I was really fascinated by this two-step migration and three steps, sometimes three step, four step. Uh, and in fact, I found that there are uh, multiple migrations involved here in, in some situations. Uh, so I started doing this research. I started talking to people from among my acquaintances. And as it happened, there are also people in my own family that I started to um, observe were also coming in this manner. Uh, the research took a long time. It was a very challenging uh, kind of research. And, um, and I can talk about that. Some of it is in the book as to why it was challenging. And um, so what I found, just because I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just making putting it in a nutshell. What I found is that many of them were coming through the Gulf countries in order to save up enough money for the proof of funds that is needed to be shown when uh, people uh, apply for to come under the skilled category to, to Canada. So that was one of the reasons. But I think most of the time, most people were coming because of uh, the limitations of not having citizenship in the Gulf countries. And, and a lot of institutional um, limitations and processes which, which exist, which uh, cause them to think about another migration. So the, the, the choice is to, to return to India and Pakistan or to look to Canada or the United States or Australia and so on. Um, and part of the findings was a familiar finding of devaluation, de-skilling, of being underemployed and so on after they come to Canada, which is a familiar story with regard to professional, you know, skilled immigrants. But the surprise, surprising finding was, was that I found that there were some, and in fact, most of the people that I interviewed who were in order to deal with the devaluation and the downward mobility, they were splitting their households so that uh, the mother would remain with the children in Canada and the father, uh, the man, uh, would return to the Gulf countries to resume their, um, their professional career. And there were different groups of them. There were some who, who came with that plan. They, they had planned not to remain in Canada. And there were others who were more reactive, like they came to settle, to stay in Canada, but uh, because of their, their negative experience within the labor market, they decided to return. So I think I'll leave it there for now and then um, see what, what others have, what the panelists have to say and then what, you, what questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanya, and I'm sure during the question and answer period, you'll be able to answer uh, some questions about uh, your research and your work in the book as well. Um, I will now uh, call on our first speaker, uh, Harshita Yalamardi, for her thoughts. Harshita is a PhD candidate in Gender, Feminist, and Women's Studies at York University. Her doctoral dissertation focuses on the experiences of Indian marriage migrant women in Canada in relation to migration policies expectations of household and care labor and caste in the diaspora. And Harshita will soon be defending her dissertation. So I wanted to shout her out as well, but over to you, Harshita. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Ethel, for that introduction, for inviting me to speak today. Um, as the only graduate student on the panel today, it's really a privilege and an honor to share space with all of you and uh, to speak alongside Dr. Tiku and Dr. Walton Roberts. Um, and to speak about Dr. Professor Tanya Dasgupta's book, Twice Migrated and Twice Displaced. 
Um, it's also a spe special pleasure because Tanya is my dissertation supervisor and she's one of the biggest reasons I am at the dissertation defense stage. So is Ethel, but Tanya is my supervisor. And it's also very special to be speaking about this book because Tanya actually shared a copy of the proofs with me uh, while I was writing one of my chapters and I was struggling um, while writing with, you know, with contextualizing and analyzing my data in a larger context. And so when I got the book, I got to use it and cite it in my, in my dissertation, but also I really learned some valuable lessons around how to connect what appear to be very micro granular details in your interviewees responses and narratives to a larger picture. And in this book, the larger picture is large. It's across three points on the globe. So that was a really valuable lesson I learned. So thank you, Tanya, not only for writing the book, but for being an amazing teacher and supervisor. Um, one of the most striking things for me in this book is that there is a very textured nature to the identities that the interlocutors, uh, that the people Tanya interviews in the book, that they shared with her. And these, these, the textures and the nuances of these identities are very closely connected to the differences in age, in religion, in the migration trajectories, and so on. There's a, there's a real diversity within the sample of people that Tanya interviews. They're both Indian and Pakistani, but at the same time, they're also of different ages, religions, different careers. And I think the book really drives home how there's no easy way to talk about the South Asian identity in Canada. For instance, you really see the role of Islamophobia in the Canadian society um, in the way, you know, your respondents who are not Muslim were narrating their relationship to Canada and to Canadian belonging, uh, as opposed to people who were Muslim. And so there's a very, very empirical understanding of how the notion of multicultural Canada that respects and incorporates all diverse religious and racial identities, it's not equitably available to everyone who is South Asian. Um, I thought your use of the concept of colonial racism to explain you know, the motivations and the structural inequalities that your interviewees had uh, experienced and experienced as a result and experienced before their migration journeys and during their migration journeys in the Gulf and in Canada, as well as in India and Pakistan, uh, was a very important uh, aspect to understanding migrant lives. Um, I thought that analysis of the neo-colonial racism is really important in understanding the bind that twice migrant professionals find themselves in. You know, when they're working in the Gulf, they're making good money, but they're unable to find stability and security through just citizenship, like you just pointed out, especially for their children. And once, it, but once they're in Canada, their credentials are devalued. But at the same time, possessing Canadian passport, Canadian status, and having Canadian work experience is what gets valued in the Gulf. So it's it was really interesting to see that the series of pragmatic decisions and calculations that have to be made at different levels to maximize economic earnings and savings at one level, but also, you know, thinking about safety and security and stability for children on for themselves and for their children and the future um, that's really like woven in throughout the book. The other thing was, you know, uh, the gender and trans and the household are really at the heart of uh, transnational decision making and transnational lifestyle and you know the the split families uh, arrangement clearly you know was coming through with the disproportionately gendered burden of care and the disproportionately gendered imbalance in decisions around migration and mobility I thought that was a really transient way of thinking about the flexibility that, that migrants are supposed to display. You know, at one point in the book, you do talk about how mobility and flexibility are a result of class privilege. But at the same time, there was a very poignant thread throughout the book about, you know, flexibility being a part of Canadian twice migrant respondents' everyday lives. You know, as we know, Canadian immigration policy for economic immigrants, you know, based on the point system, is looking for designer migrants, people who are highly skilled, highly educated, entrepreneurial, 
flexible in the face of economic changes and instability. And they're chosen for, you know, fulfilling specific identified needs and lacks in the Canadian uh, economic sectors. And as you pointed out, a lot of the times it's an unregulated professions. But the designer migrant model also looks for spousal units, conjugal units, where the spouse's qualifications um, and any connection that the spouse might have to uh, prior, prior connections in Canadian society like really boosts their migration prospects through the adaptability criteria. So I thought you were really talking about that in the South Asian case very specifically when in, you know, in the conclusion you say, and I'm citing here, this is the kind of labor power that politicians, policymakers, and capitalists are looking for. Uh, since they migrate as heterosexual families and households, they are assumed to be stable, reliable, and indispensable as workers, consumers, and taxpayers. And sponsored spouses provide educated and um, skilled labor to, to fill in precarious jobs. And this, to me, is also an understanding, a part of the understanding of South Asians in Canada not only in public discourse, but in self-description as well as model minorities, people who fit into the Canadian society and economy very well, as opposed to other racialized communities, sometimes at the cost of other racialized communities. So I think the book really peels away the layers and helps us look under the surface of how this model minority image and this drive towards immigrant success really exacts its price. And the price is disproportionately paid by wives, by mothers, and um, you know, through the kind of split transnational arrangements that you know, not, not all the respondents are happy with and they really struggle with. Um, you know, the pragmatic and strategic decisions that they have to make to maintain what you call a passport security, while also maximizing advantages in you know, this unequal global social order in terms of economic earnings and savings. Um, there's a part where you describe um, your respondent Zakia's description of her ambivalent identity. And again, I'm quoting from the book where she says, uh, you know, she, she was one of the most engaged and successfully settled people that you interviewed, but at the same time, she regretted you know, the decision to come to Canada because of the downward class mobility she experienced and the adverse effect on her children and the splitting of her family. Um, and, you know, once she became a Canadian citizen, she thought it would be good for her children to have that stable basis. But for herself, she felt he, she was a global citizen. So there is an ambivalence that's working at all times. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is that seeing the motivations of your respondents in the book to, you know, obtain safety and stability for their children, and especially through citizenship that Canada can offer and does selectively offer, I thought it would, it was really bringing into context for me, the struggles of other workers and immigrants who are not as privileged. So temporary foreign workers or domestic and care workers whose demands, whose migrant justice demands in Canada take the form of demanding permanent status and residence and uh, you know, avenues to reunite their families if they want that. So I think the book kind of adds to that call for migrant justice for all workers, not just for economic immigrants, but for temporary foreign workers as well. And I thought that was very valuable. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And thank you for the book, Tanya. Thank you so much, Harshita. Uh, these are really important reflections. And hearing you speak, it makes me think about the ongoing strategies that migrants make to end gender security and the contradictions imbued in the migration process. Uh, but now I'd like to ask Dr. Alicia Tiku to share her thoughts. Dr. Tiku holds a PhD from the Department of Politics at York University. She has taught at Brock and York University in Women and Gender Studies, International Development, and Globalization Studies. Her work is grounded in an interdisciplinary approach to feminist political economy, geography and globalization studies, critical race and post-colonial theory, as well as labor, migration, and citizenship studies. Her research examines the conditions which give rise to networks of female migrant labor as they shape emerging global cities by tracing the historical genealogies of colonialism and development. 
More recently, she has been working on an autoethnographic piece of work that examines the intersections between motherhood, mental health, trauma, and colonialism. Alicia, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that, Ethel. Um, and thank you so much for organizing this and to Alicia and the YCAR team and everyone who was involved in creating this opportunity for us to be together. Um, of course, big thank you goes out to Professor Desgupta for the incredible contribution that um, she has created here in this book, which was born uh, from over 10 years of ethnographic research, which I just want to commend you on that because it's an incredible body of work there. Um, I just want to start by saying how much I really enjoyed reading this study from the beginning to the end. And I, it's rare that I think we read an entire book from beginning to end these days, right? So I really, really enjoyed it. And I find this to be such a multidisciplinary contribution that, as you can see from my bio, I really appreciate. <laughs> so I just want to start off, I'll jump right in, um, on some notes uh, regarding the structure of the book. Uh, I really, really appreciated the ways that readers were allowed to follow the journey of this unique group of Gulf South Asian migrants. And through that deep ethnographic look you gave us, we saw all these complex sets of factors and structures, both institutionalized, but also the personal and familial in shaping the journey of these twice migrants. So it was an incredible way of expressing that tremendous complexity with such an ease and a flow that made the book very enjoyable to read. So I really appreciated that. Um, and at every opportunity you, that you were able to add a kind of historical context and to give insight into the processes of coloniality and racialization, you did. Um, whether that be from the role of migrants in knowingly or unknowingly participating in forms of settler colonialism, to the ways in which white expats in the Gulfs were exalted uh, in what I refer to in some of my work as these kind of hierarchies of entitlement, right? So processes, ideas, and structures that determine who is entitled to what um, and on what basis do they have access to rights and opportunities. And you've explained this very interestingly through that concept of neo-racism, which I'll come back to later. Um, to the ways in which migration in your case studies isn't a straightforward process of global south to the global north, but in reality it's the complex trade-off and negotiation and sacrifices that have to be made um, amongst, you know, families and communities of migrants. To the ways in which, you know, you've challenged these traditionally held ideas that are propagated by the Canadian government and the broader kind of global imaginary about the possibilities of can Canada as a dream that's sold to professional migrants um, who then face significant challenges in realizing this Canadian multicultural dream once they arrive. And I think you've highlighted the very real everyday lived realities of migrants as they navigate the systemic barriers to their quote integration. And then this then leads us to very interesting questions about belonging in Canada and beyond. And it highlights the complex ways in which different groups negotiate these questions. And all of this is done with insight into the political and socioeconomic landscapes in which these types of ideas are generated. So thank you. <laughs> it's a big contribution. And I really, really appreciated how at every turn where you could provide that broader historical context and to see the ways in which race, gender, and class intersect, you did. Um, so I think I'll just turn to a few comments about areas that stood out to me particularly as someone who's working on issues related to migration and labor in the Gulf. So one of those areas that you focused on that I think is not often highlighted um, is the, the sector of the population that you focus on. So these professional class of workers. So there's been a lot of work done about female domestic workers and other care workers, as well as kind of low waged uh, workers in different, you know, highly exploitative sectors. But your study allows us a window into a more privileged world. However, as you shall show us then, while Gulf South Asians do experience this relative degree of privilege, they're also part of this highly racialized group that faces limitations, discrimination, and disadvantage in both spaces. So it's that kind of nuance and complexity that we really get across multiple contexts. 
And I think this is significant given the disconnect between that and the pull factors and the systemic features of the Canadian immigration system, like Harsha mentioned, in terms of, you know, the desirable migrants or the designer, sorry, migrants that the Canadian state is looking for, right? And so another one of these kind of big contributions that stuck out to me was this examination of neo-racism um, and racial discrimination and the resultant downwards mobility and its impact on the materiality of work, coupled with the ways that these processes impact ideas and feelings of belonging. So in this way, we were able to see both the material kind of conditions of work and labor, and also the kind of ideological reality and the apparatus that accompanies those everyday lived realities. So we have so much um, nuance and scale happening that I really, really appreciated. Um, of particular interest to me was this concept of neo-racism because anybody working on the Gulf can attest to the fact that this is one of those areas that we really trying to find a language to articulate how these hierarchies are generated and on what basis, right? And so I think it was a unique way to examine that complexity of racism and discrimination, which isn't, like you say, just about skin color or physical features, but it's also based heavily on citizenship and ethnic status. So neo-racism, as you explained to us, as a cultural form of racism based on difference um, and devaluation um, about culture and also the incommensurability is something that I really, really look forward to theorizing more deeply in my own work. Um, what was I going to say here? So one of the ways that, I, you know, I've taken this up that I think is interesting, too, and relates to your work is how these hierarchies are born out of this larger colonial history, right? And how spaces such as particular cities or uh, migrant destinations, in my work, for example, I looked at Dubai, also kind of have this desire to be acknowledged as a global city. And what that kind of pressure does in creating who is desirable and who is not, as well as you know how those hierarchies are generated. So there's so much to be done in understanding the complexities of how these different sectors of the population are endowed with different levels and sets of possibilities and um, you know rights under the larger umbrella of neoliberal globalization. And so I think neo-racism offers us a very interesting window into this complicated world. So taken together, all of these areas and this analysis ultimately leads us to a very interesting challenge, I think, to notions of multicultural citizenship. Um, and, you know, this challenge to these deeply rooted ideas about Canada as a multicultural haven has, has been done and scholars have exposed to us, you know, the kinds of facades um, that this is, but your case study allows us to see how this is experienced through everyday lived reality and that really complicated negotiation. And I think this powerful grounded analysis of those connections between, you know, neoliberal globalization, citizenship, labor, and the ideologies that accompany that really helps us to see and understand who belongs and on what basis. Um, uniquely then, the case study that you've used here allows us to challenge citizenship in Canada as an automatic marker of belonging, right? And I really appreciated that fact, you know, where you were able to show us that while citizenship may be possible, racialized minorities who have acquired this status continue to be seen as different because of all kinds of, you know, um, religious and cultural practices, for example, as you highlight. And, you know, just a quote here then, citizenship is not just a legal status, it's a highly racialized process. Um, whereby then migrants are granted permanent residence on the basis of their skills, as you highlight, and then stripped of those credentials by these professional associations. So we really, really get to see how this racialized process leads to that downward mobility and the devaluation of these international credentials is itself a form of that neo-racism that you're highlighting for us. Um, one of the striking examples that I really appreciated was when you brought up that study of physicians who were trained outside of Canada in Singapore um, with identical qualifications who were assessed favorably if they were white compared to their non-white counterparts. And there's a quote that, you know, I had to highlight there. For white physicians, foreign credentials were seen as an asset. I mean, there's so much to unpack there, but it really struck me there as, you know, a really important way that um, 
you know, how that race operates, right? In the Gulf context specifically, there are so many layers. Um, and that was really, um, yeah, on point for me. I think overall, it's a powerful analysis of the way that racialization as a set of processes can also not always be so intentional, but the ways that those apparently neutral processes have this disproportionate and disadvantaging effect, as you highlight. Um, Oh, I really liked this part too. You know, I highlighted the concept of multicultural citizenship that you argue. And I'll just read this quote because it's so perfectly said. A colonial policy, that it would remain, sorry, a colonial policy with a clear notion of who has the power to recognize others and to be the judge of the kind and extent of cultural and ethnic pride immigrants can hold, particularly from racialized and minority religious and ethnic groups, and the power to delineate what and who is Canadian. So I think, again, there you just see how all of these ideas come together in this really powerful challenge um, to multicultural citizenship in Canada. So overall, I'll just end by highlighting, you know, two additional things that I think are really huge contributions that we can take away from this, which one, you really do challenge the idea that migrants are powerless subjects. And instead of seeing them as passive, you highlight the ways that they exert their agency at every step of the way. And the second thing is that we are really challenging these traditional assumptions about migrant roots. Um, and instead, we've complicated uh, the movements from global south to global north, highlighting those multiple stops and then going back sometimes. And it leads to so many questions about what the future holds for out migration from the global north even. I think that's very interesting. And how emerging global cities such as those uh, in the Gulf and in Asia more generally can become stops for migrants in you know, another leg of the journey that you mentioned. Um, and so I think as belonging becomes increasingly complicated, I like, found myself wondering, for example, how even second generation Canadians born of immigrant parents imagine their future within Canada. And I think that we'll continue to see the movement of migrants that challenges the assumption of south to north migration as the only or preferred route. Um, you know, even for me, I have friends in different professions who really are considering more and more, do I want to stay in Canada? Why would I stay here? The quality of life, the, you know, there's a lot of consideration there. So anyway, I think it's a very interesting piece that brings up so many questions. So thank you for the contribution and for all the questions that your work has ignited. And I'm grateful to have been a part of the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tika, for your for, Dr. Tika, for your remarks. Uh, your, mar your remarks have made me actually really excited about the book and has made me reflect on the notion of neo-racism as it operates in the lives of migrants, especially in the everyday, and thinking about neo-racism amidst the backdrop of neoliberal globalization and multicultural citizenship is incredibly provocative. So your remarks have also given me a lot to think about. Uh, and last but not the least, I'd now like to call on Dr. Margaret Walton Roberts to share her thoughts. Dr. Walton Roberts is a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University and the Bowsley School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Canada. Her research interests are in gender and migration, transnational networks, and immigrant settlement. Her current research focuses on gender and the international migration of healthcare professionals and international student migration. Welcome, Margaret. Wonderful. Thank you, Ethel. And uh, thank you, Alicia and Harshita for your wonderful comments um, before. And, and this is such a great opportunity. So I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Tanya, for writing this book. Um, it's beautiful. The cover is wonderful. Like you can see, I have it behind me here. Um, it's so exciting to see this work. Um, your, your book, Twice Migrated, Twice Displaced, makes a significant contribution to scholarly debates regarding citizenship and international migration processes. And I think that's clearly articulated by both Hashita and Alicia in their comments. Um, I consider a particular strength of the material in the book is the ambivalence that's revealed by respondents about the economic uh, opportunities they're presented in Canada. The complex grid of factors that shape why migrants make the decisions they do uh, to engage in multiple migrations is really important to discuss. And so I agree with the panelists on that point. 
The balance between citizenship rights, social policy in terms of education, health, employment, income, earning opportunities, jobs, taxes, regulations, quality of life in the present and the future, as mentioned. Um, these are all complex and multifaceted. And Tanya's book uh, really uh, examines this context in some detail. And so in some ways it follows uh, the path that was set by Parminda Bachu's landmark book in 1985. Uh, twice migrants East African Sikh settlers in Britain. Um, Tanya, you highlight agency as, as Parminda did in that book very strongly. But I, but I think the ambivalence that you detail in such a deep and textual way, as, as Hoshita mentioned, is really something kind of different. And perhaps it's kind of reflective of, um, you know, what Bauman calls this era, this liquid modernity, you know, to the, con the condition of constant mobility and change and the anxiety that is aligned with that seeking the best opportunities. And I think that's very clearly articulated through your work. I also think your book makes a really important point about arguments regarding flexible workers needing to be extended to flexible families. And as uh, you quote, it appears, as you say, I quote, it appears that neoliberal and racially discriminatory labor markets in both the Gulf and in Canada, not only create conditions for flexible labor, but give rise to flexible families and households, end quote. I think this has perhaps come up in other work about separated families. Certainly, I think um, Alicia commented on the work on, on caregivers, micro caregivers. But this really is an interesting example because you're looking at more middle class skilled migrants and it suggests in some ways a widening and a deepening of global capitalism's influence on social reproduction and family formation. You might also, um, and so I, I think that's really important and I think it's something to highlight about your scholarly contribution. Um, we were posed some questions as panelists, and the second question was, you know, what are the larger questions that your work has provoked for me? And, and there's lots of questions, but one that I was kind of interested in was the point about Hindu nationalism and Hindutva movements. And you address this complexity in the book to explain why some Muslim Indians leave India. Um, and you do mention that these ideologies spread in diaspora, um, but I would be interested to hear more about this um, and about the intersectionality of this. Um, because, you know, I remember, I think it was in 2014, just after the BJP had won this kind of landslide, I attended an IIT um, alumni networking convention in Toronto, and I was really struck by the... Um, how buoyed the audience were at the results of this election. It kind of surprised me. And so I'm very interested to think about the intersectionality of this. And in some ways, if it reproduces certain kinds of privileges within diaspora in terms of the caste, class, religion, region, identities. So I would be interested to think about, to, to hear some of Tanya's thoughts on that. Um, and then the third question uh, that Ethel had put to us is in what ways do you see Tanya's work as applying to your own work? And there are so many ways. And again, as the panelists, uh, as the two panelists before me have highlighted, there's so much richness in here. But I would also echo the fascinating uh, focus on different citizenship limitations that are faced by migrants in the uh, GCC countries, in the Gulf countries. This is a really rich field of inquiry. And I was just reading recently, um, the UAE has created a new citizenship pathway for elite migrants. But what's been fascinating about this is the backlash it has actually created within the population. Because for example, if you are an, an Emirati woman and you marry um, and, and you, your children, your father, the father of your children is not Emirati, your children don't get citizenship. And there's also, um, they have many uh, GCC countries have large what's called bidoon populations, people without papers who didn't register as citizens at independence of those countries. And so they still kind of reside in this ambivalent place without citizenship. And so this is fascinating because it adds to the complexity of what citizenship means. But moreover, I found all kinds of there's recently been so much interesting work on the experiences that immigrants um, to the European Union, for example, have been granted European citizenship, and then they take those passports 
back to the Gulf countries in order to work because they want to escape the forms of discrimination they've experienced in the EU, return to the Gulf for the benefits that it offers in terms of proximity to their homeland, better pay because of the, the because of the passport they carry, but they're escaping some of that kind of neo-racism that I think Tanya is highlighting. And so, for example, Marie Paco, who does work on twice migrant nurses, she recounts stories of Indian Kerala nurses who now have gone to India, who then, uh, sorry, Ireland, then return to the Gulf in order to be close to their homelands. And so I think this is really um, something fascinating and it really illustrates Tanya's point about how nationally defined structures, priorities and values were partially kind of circumvented by immigrants through step or multiple migrations or via transnational living which simultaneously maintained older identities along with new hybrid and sometimes contested senses of home and belonging in Canada. So I find this circumnavigation or strategizing is key to the range of capitals that migrants accrue in their multi-step journeys. And those multi-steps are, as Alicia said, increasingly complexified. You know, it can be going in one direction, coming back in another. And so I really do think we are looking at something uh, quite dynamic and interesting to reveal. And, and this is another, you know, I'll, I'll kind of double down on this point about the increasing complexity of migration pathways. And, you know, the spatially differentiated regimes of skill that govern them and that create contexts that distend the temporariness of the migrant experience for migrants as they engage in two step circular seasonal and intermittent mobility. Um, Empirical research on migration has really tended to underplay the scope and importance of these multiple migrations. And, um, you know, I found some really interesting work looking at issues of transit migration uh, that highlight the significance of it. So, so data from the USA shows that about 9% of migrant arrivals between 2001, 2012 were living in a country other than their birthplace before they arrived in the US. And this increases to 14% for those with tertiary education. Um, and so these kind of multiple migrations are framed by all kinds of decisions about um, costs and opportunities and processes. But um, researchers, and I'm he thinking here of a piece of work by a couple of economists, Artuk and Ozdan, what I find interesting about their work is they actually look at how people make a decision about the country they go to first because of the opportunities that country permits them in the visas they can get subsequently. So it's almost as if migrants are making a multi-dimensional uh, decision at one time. So they're thinking ahead, okay, if I go here now and I work and I get experience, that will allow me entry to this country. And so the knock-on effect of those processes in terms of the complex kind of decision-making and analysis and understanding the visa regimes is a really fascinating field of research. And I think Tanya's work, has, uh, Tan, Professor Descoptor's work has really given us some fascinating insight into that. And so I think there's much still to be done, but again, I want to commend uh, Professor Descoptor on this wonderful book, 10 Years of, of you know, deep ethnographic work as Alicia has already highlighted. And I would just wanna say overall, the book really reveals the strategies employed by middle-class migrant families to secure class reproduction and further upward mobility under conditions of neoliberal globalization. I appreciate the author's careful intersectional analysis of the internal heterogeneity of South Asian Gulf twice migrants in relation to their migration and integration experiences. And I think the research reveals a range of social, cultural and economic capital that's amassed by these families and the complex decision making that occurs in order to secure the majority of these families needs and desires. And in the process, the outcomes spread across a broad spectrum of identities, including ambivalent, flexible, hybrid, reactive and singular Canadian identities, detailing this range of identities and their varied connections with labour market and other experiences in Canada is so well documented in this book, and I commend you for that. This is particularly important since the findings suggest that it is Muslim men who harbour the most ambivalent feelings about their attachment to Canada which suggests the author is in, this is in part a function of 
a kind of reactive identity developed in response to a heightened sense of discrimination in Canada. And so the book offers us so many important findings and so many important research doors to open. Thank you, Professor Desgupta. Thank you so much, Margaret. And really, what a joy to have migration experts commenting on Tanya's book. In fact, Margaret, when you were talking, I was just thinking, you know, one of the great things about Tanya's book and about your work and actually everyone in this panel's work is it shines a light on migrants' community decisions and individual decisions separate from state policy. So as you were talking, I was like, well, you know, it resonates with Filipino migrants as well, where they try to go to Hong Kong or Singapore, thinking that that would then give them a toehold into coming to Canada, right? And so I think Tanya's work reveals that when it comes to multiple migrations, um, there's a larger and deeper and more complex story to be told here. So thank you, Margaret, for your remarks. I'd now like to pass uh, the spotlight once again to Tanya uh, in case you wanted to respond to some of these reflections and some of the questions that our panelists raised as well. Uh, Tanya, I'm so sorry, you're muted. I'm sorry. I wanted to start by, by thanking the panelists for their uh, insightful uh, comments, very, very thoughtful, um, um, in-depth reading uh, of my work. I really appreciate um, all the, you know, positive things that you have said. Uh, I really appreciate it because um, I haven't, I, I think people of, uh, people like me have not received, have not necessarily uh, received a lot of support in academia. Um, so I don't take this support for granted. So I just wanted to say that, that I really appreciate that. Um, much, much to think about. You have raised such important issues, you know, and I've made so many comments. Um, Hashita talked about the model minority image and the drive towards immigrant success, which definitely twice migrated migrants and direct migrants from South Asia are very much you know, uh, engulfed in that kind of process. But uh, you point out the cost to pay for it. And um, most of the time the costs are paid by the women in the households and sometimes the children and perhaps the men too. But it is uh, you know, the burden of, of single parenting and and uh, that, that kind of flexibilizing of the household has implications for social reproductive labor. So, so that is really something to think about, something which I didn't think about in the book, you know, how that the experience that, that I talked about in the book, how that again, you know, impacts on this model minority image and whether that, you know, and what kind of pressures and costs that, that puts on them. Um, I think um, many of you talked about the neo racism. It seems like that struck a chord with many of you, and and uh, that's very satisfying to 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 hear. You know the affirmation of that uh, framework. I I want to say that new. I I did focus on neo racism, which looks at uh, racism, which is on the basis of different citizenship, uh, lack of national, or a perception that you that one doesn't belong in the nation, um, the incommensurability of of certain groups of migrants. But I also want to say that while I focused on neo racism, anti black racism is also very much there uh, in the Gulf uh, countries as well as, of course, in Canada. We've been we, we've been talking about that uh, more so lately. So I I think that. My, uh, my uh, comment would be that there are all these different types of racisms happening together. And, uh, but, uh, but this notion of neo-racism, I think is, is very important also in terms of the experience of Muslim um, immigrants, particularly you know, in, in my case, uh, I saw it uh, most definitely uh, you know, from the Indian Muslims and Pakistani Muslim uh, experiences in Canada. But I also want to add that there are differences 
between the experiences and the responses of Muslim migrants from India and Pakistan. And that's also a very interesting thing uh, that, that I found um, that, you know, the different experiences of, you know, sometimes we tend to homogenize uh, the experience of Islamophobia and, you know, the, the uh, ra particular racism against uh, Muslims. But in this, um, in my research, I found that there was a difference between Indian Muslims and Pakistani Muslims, difference in their experience and also in their response to that experience. Um, let's see, there were so many great points. Um, citizenship, um, just a shout out about the poster and the cover. The cover for the book was uh, designed by UBC Press, so I have to thank them for that. And, and the poster for this book launch, I also want to say was a, uh, was, it was produced by Alex and Alicia. I think it was a joint effort from YCAR. So uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, uh, I think um, uh, the other point that maybe I'll just touch on is uh, Margaret's point around Hindutva and how that has had an impact on migration, uh, both for Hindus moving out, like the IT, workers that you were talking about, the IT professionals, um, as well as for Muslims. And I think now with the BJP being in power in India more and more, anecdotally, what I hear is that more Muslim uh, Muslims uh, in India are thinking of moving out of India or, or looking at or considering uh, whether that might be a good thing for them to do. Um, but, um, but of course, that is also a, a thing of privilege. You know, who can move out? Uh, the people who, there are lots of people, most people cannot move out because you need to be, you need to have the capital, uh, different financial capital, social capital, different forms of capital to be able to move also. So that is there as well. Um, well, I, th I think, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, just touching on Ethel's comment about how decision-making, you know, the structure agency debate, what is it? Is it the structures that cause us to, uh, to plan our migration in a particular way, or, or is it agency? Do migrants, you know, figure out the pathways around the structures? So I think that, um, in my research, what I'm trying to show is that it's a dialectical process. Of course, the structures and the institutions shape our plans and our behaviors, but uh, people on the ground also exercise uh, a lot of creativity in how to navigate around the, the blocks that they experience, you know, the border making practices that they have. And I think that the strategies of two migrations and the split families and transnational living are examples of that, of, of how people are devising different ways of navigating around discriminatory uh, structures that they encounter. Thank you very much. I think I'll uh, once again, really uh, thank you uh, very much for stimulating my, my thinking even further um, and perhaps you know, I'll be thinking about it for a long time and maybe coming up with other research projects if I have the energy to do that. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Tanya. And the Q&A box is on fire. So we actually have uh, in the chat box and also in the Q&A box, um, six questions. Uh, the first question, so I'll just kind of take one question and then you can answer it and you know hopefully we'll have time to answer all of them. Uh, just as a reminder, if people have any questions, please put it in the Q&A or the chat box. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do you think about the connection between migration from India and other low socioeconomic countries? And how do you situate the economies of poor countries that are under the full control of multinational corporations and financial institutions? Tanya? Oh, it's for me? Okay. Um, thank you for that question. I think that's a very, very uh, fundamental question that 
you know, and I'm also very interested in that, that how migration is connected to the whole global capitalism, basically. And, um, and multinationals are, of course, an example, uh, an indication of, of how capitalism is working uh, now, uh, particularly you know, in, the, in the current phase of capitalism. So multinationals in, in global South countries, even in global North countries, um, that is, you know, it's connected to um, the inequality, the global inequalities that we have, the, even, even this kind of framework of thinking about global North countries, global South countries, it's a continuation of the colonialism that we had hundreds of, you know, uh, the direct colonialism in many of these global South countries. Um, so it's, it's just a reformulation of colonial relations. Uh, and of course, there's articulation with settler colonialism um, in a country like Canada. So, uh, and, and of course, these processes are exactly what trigger migrations, you know, because the ec economics is, of course, fundamental. Uh, the labor issues, why people migrate uh, is, is very, very fundamental. But I think in my research, it, uh, we also see other factors that also intervene in why people move, you know, educational reasons, people move because they want a better future for their children. People move because of, just, some people move because of a sense of adventure, uh, you know, um, or there's an internalized kind of uh, thinking, which I kind of, uh, again, connect to colonial racism, that there's a sense that the West is the best kind of thinking. Um, so there are some people who, you know, we, I would, you know, sometimes think, why did they even migrate if they're going to be facing downward global, you know, um, mobility and so on. But I think that some of the motivations are very complicated, very complex. And so I, I hope, hopefully I try to show how the motivations are very multi-layered, but I, I agree with you that the economics is very, very fundamental you know, the globalized global capitalism and the um, quote unquote underdevelopment of global South countries by the workings of multinationals, which siphon out uh, the resources from out of the country and also the, the distortion of the economies that result as a result of, you know, the, the whole, um, the international loans uh, schemes and so on, you know, the workings of WTO and IMF and so on. So those are very, very key to understand. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, the next question is, what are the author's hopes for research to be incorporated in policies, for example, within labor ministries or settlement organizations? Um, and how might these policies go towards addressing the issues raised in the book? Hmm, policies. Um... I knew this would come up and I was trying to think about policies in the book too. Um, I, I think the in terms of policy, one of the things to, I think multiculturalism, which is Alicia raised that issue, you know, the, this question of Canada as a nation, who we are, who belongs, who doesn't belong, who is suspect uh, because, you know, we, um, there is this assumption then that when people become citizens, you know, they, they should belong or they do belong in the country. But I think that many of us here uh, have raised the issue of how that doesn't often happen and that it's very, very racialized. And, um, and uh, religion has something to do with it also in the post 9-11 period. So I think that that is something to, to think about in terms of policy, um, you know, to ask ourselves what kind, of, what kind of multiculturalism do we have? What does it mean? You know, uh, who controls, who is part of which group and, and who is to be seen as, as, as a Canadian and so on. So I think that, um, I think that those issues are very fundamental that you know, this, this work made me think about that. And I think also the other issues are still there, like the settlement issues. 
what is involved. Like if we have split households in Canada, what does it mean for settlement workers? Uh, what kind of support systems can be given uh, to, to those households? And, 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 also to, and also it gives us hopefully material for us to do more advocacy that, that uh, people's professional qualifications should be honored and should be recognized so that they don't, that they're not so underemployed that they have to think about leaving the country. Uh, basically they're migrant labor. So, you know, because they, they were not able to get something which is in their field, um, they had to, you know, think of going back to the Gulf countries. I mean, I had people who were engineers and IT people and, and business administration and MBA uh, holders who were doing temporary agency work. Uh, they were taxi driving, um, you know, so, so gross uh, underemployment and particularly affecting um, uh, those who were Muslims, uh, particularly from Pakistan. My sample was small, but still there's an indication of, of um, Islamophobia uh, working in the labor market. So I think I'm, I'm kind of rambling here, but I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, the, hopefully the material can be used by people who do activism and who do advocacy work around why should it be the case that people have to leave the country because they're not able to pursue their careers and professions. I hope that touches on some of some of it. Fantastic. Um, you know, I'm going to collect maybe two questions because uh, there's a few more questions in the Q&A. Uh, one question is, how did you uh, select who would be featured in this, this book? How do you select the participants? Um, and uh, another, actually two sets of questions, uh, both similar, uh, wanted you to elaborate on the differences between um, Indian Muslims and Pakistani Muslims and kind of their, their reactions and their uh, you know, uh, settlement in, in Canada as well. Okay, thank you so much for, for, for these questions. Um, uh, first on the method, methodology, a little bit on that, I basically used a snowball technique. So I, I started talking to people that I knew among my friends and acquaintances. And then from there, it kind of snowballed. Um, and then, um, once I found out about the transnational households, I kind of made a, a, a pointed outreach to try and reach them. And that was very challenging. That took a long time. And I talk in the book about how many of these households, they feel very criminalized and um, very vulnerable. Uh, so they don't feel like talking to, to researchers about why they're, you know, why they have these uh, transnational households. And so I had to use very creative means and um, do a lot of outreach, you know, through community workers and things like that to, uh, to reach them. And then some of them, um, I have some people, as I mentioned, in my own family, actually, who, um, who, who have uh, used these uh, strategies. So so I, I, that I gained, you know, I, I, it, it was very helpful uh, for me. So in a sense, it was also very targeted outreach that I was doing because I was trying to discover the story in there. I was trying to discover, uh, you know, trying to understand why these pathways were being used. And what was the second question? It was... Uh, uh, just elaborating on the different experiences between um, Pakistani oh. Muslims and Indian Muslims. I, I thank you. I, I think that uh, what I noticed was that again, sample is very small, but for the Pakistani Muslims, there was a real sense of rea reactive identity when there is a negative experience in the labor market, as well as households which are forced to be split. So if there are multiple negativity uh, experienced in terms of, um, you know, kind of settling down in Canada and finding jobs and things like that, there was a, a sense of alienation and a lack of belonging that I found. Um, you know, so uh, as opposed to Indian Muslim families who were also, you know, experienced Islamophobia and things like that, 
but their response was not a reactive um, kind of identity um, so much as you know they may have become more critical of of um, you know the system and and speaking out and things like that and some of it could be the historical experience of India and Pakistan and the kind of transnationalism that they have had traditionally. Uh, remember the Muslims in India have, I'm speculating here totally, uh, and I would love to hear other people comment on this, that um, Muslims in India have sort of, they, they are a minority within India. So it's like the whole, the dynamics are very different there. And, um, the discourse of secularism and, and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas in Pakistan, it's a majority Muslim country. They have dual citizenship. So there are, there are different ways in which uh, the, the two nations are, 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 are framed and set up and, the, and different ways in which people who have migrated out of the country relate back to the mother country. Uh, so I think that it's a complicated thing, but I did notice uh, different responses from them. But I would welcome if anybody else has a comment on this. As always, when having a rich discussion, I'm aware that we only have eight minutes left. So what I'll do is, again, the Q&A is on fire. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to try to kind of group questions together. And Tanya, you can pick which questions you'd like to mm -hmm. answer. Um, one question is, could you please speak to the space and time entangle entanglements of twice migrated South Asians a little bit? So uh, space and time entanglements of twice migrated South Asians a little bit. Uh, there's also a question regarding emerging class-based solidarities. Um, you know, there's different types of racism happening together. Are there these solidarities based on class emerging from these groups? And do they see their struggles as tied to migrants who are less affluent? So these are the people who you've interviewed, uh, such as domestic workers who they employ in the Gulf. That's a really great question. And uh, one last question is, um, you know, uh, what are the commonalities and differences between the professional privileged migrant workers and the more widely studied low skilled workers. So that question is related to the previous question. And how can the analysis of the migration of middle class professional workers apply to other global south, global north migration, such as Indian, Chinese, highly skilled workers in the US? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tanya. Um, we only now have six minutes left, so go. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, well, space and time entanglements, I don't think I, I can comment on it. Maybe Margaret can. Um, I would have to think about it a little bit. I haven't quite um, you know, thought about it uh, enough. So I'll, I'll pass on that. Um, emerging class-based solidarities and you know, solidarities with less affluent migrants, uh, one of the things that I didn't do in my research is, is to ask them about uh, how they feel about uh, political organizing. So the agency, uh, I didn't really probe whether the agency leads to any kind of resistance and solidarity efforts. And that is something that I wish I, I had done. Um, uh, so, uh, but, but we can really see the similarity of experiences, even though they're two different, you know, so-called high-skilled and, you know, I don't like these uh, these categories of high-skilled and low-skilled um, because we all know that skill is a is is a politicized uh, term. It's a political term because even in the so-called low-skilled sector, we have, for instance, I mean, in the care workers, uh, we know that many of them are doctors and nurses and and highly skilled. Uh, professional workers, but they come through a particular uh, pathway, through a particular category. So, and that is also very interesting how the categories kind of frame uh, high skill and low skill and, and so on. Um, but um, I think that the material could be used to develop solidarities because the, the experience that these middle-class people had in, um, in the Gulf countries with the kafala system there is very similar to what the care workers go through here in, uh, in, you know, in Canada. 
uh, you're again tied to, and particularly with the live-in caregiver program and and uh, and, and and the uh, the programs that that Canada has had earlier, is very much a tied system, you know. And some people have called it a, a kind of a, an indentured quote unquote indentured system. But that is the same system that exists in the Gulf. So so there are real parallels that you see. Uh, the, the only difference is that in in um, in Canada they uh, or in the Gulf it's practiced with all groups of migrants. So it's really, but there are of course different experiences. Um, so the potential is there for that kind of class solidarity, but whether it actually happens or not, that's a different thing. Because as we know, the potential doesn't mean actuality. You know, the objective conditions are there for solidarities, but that doesn't mean that it's going to automatically happen. Because as Harshita was pointing out, uh, the professional uh, migrants from India and Pakistan are very much trying to be the model uh, minority and, and make it, you know, uh, and make it and, and be quote unquote successful and so on. So that kind of aspiration is there. Um, but whether some people get politicized in the process given their experience, and I'm sure they do, because many of them talked, uh, you know, how they talked with me indicated that they do uh, have an understanding of the commonalities of migrants um, in different countries. So I think I'll leave it there. I know we, we are constrained with time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, we only have two minutes left before the end of our event. Uh, I do apologize for people who've raised beautiful questions in the chat, uh, such are the things with these events that we are always pressed for time. Uh, I'd like to invite if other panelists wanted to, uh, you know, make final comments for Tanya before we close 30 second comments. Uh, Harshita, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, um, I wanted to say a big thank you to the panelists, to Ethel, to Tanya. This has been a big learning experience. I've been making lots of notes. But I think one of the things I wanted to point out about your respondents in the book, Tanya, I think, and it's, I think in, some, in response to some of the questions that came up, one of, what, what was really uh, striking was also the sense that your respondent stories are not over. The migration journeys are still ongoing. And, you know, people have grown children, you know, you interviewed some children, you interviewed some mothers and fathers. And so there was very clearly a sense that it's really migration is not a linear journey. And people are making these decisions, like you said, creative decisions in responses to political uh, changes and shifts that were happening, as well as, you know, uh, what, um, employment and educational opportunities, as well as perceived opportunities for making better, uh, earning more money and making being able to be closer to home and so on. So uh, there was that sense of the book, you know, finding the migrants at a point in their lives while they're in Canada, but not drawing a, a, a stop there. The sense that people's journeys are ongoing as well. So um, that was something that came up as you were speaking and as some of the questions were uh, being asked. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Harshita. Uh, Alicia, any final thoughts, provocations, comments? Nothing really to add. Just want to say thank you so much for the discussion. Always more questions than answers, but I think that's what we would always strive for. So thank you for the discussion to everyone. And Margaret. Yeah, thank you. Such a rich and engaging discussion, uh, which is reflecting the rich and engaging book that Professor Descoupto has produced. So thank you. I just maybe I'll just say a few words on the question about the the spatial and temporal entanglement, space and time. I think um, it's there's a there's such an interesting vein of discussion about space and time. You know, as migration scholars, we tend to get a bit obsessive about space. You know, we love mapping things and you know, drawing lines and understanding what's going on in terms of directionality. 
But all of this has a temporal dimension to it as well. And so obviously for Tanya's work, she's followed these migrants over a long period of time. And within that period of time, a number of decisions have been made and they're made both with a spatial and temporal feature to them. But the state also operates uh, on those two dimensions. And so of course, migration policy, there's these spatial dimensions, there's also a temporal feature. So there's a lot of researchers who've looked at the way in which the refugee process really engages with waiting, the politics of waiting, which in itself becomes an architecture of that form of mobility. And so for skilled migrants, I think the issue of time in terms of things like credential processing, you know, how does time become integrated into the architecture of bordering and migration processes? And so I think that's an interesting question for us to think about and certainly is emulated in the book in lots of interesting ways. Um, but again, thank you for the opportunity. This has been a fascinating uh, panel and thank you for um, Professor Daskubda for producing this book. It's wonderful to see it out in print. Can I jump in one last? Yeah, go ahead. This was in response to Rana's question. And I don't know if you brought it up, Tanya, but I think your book would be a very powerful uh, a basis evidence for reforming or making interventions into the credential valuing systems because mm -hmm. you know as you pointed out as margaret has spoken about it's it really makes a big uh, impact on downward class mobility especially for women so yeah mm -hmm. yes thank I you love those conversations uh tanya over to you congratulations again you get the final word and i'm just gonna kind of clap and i know we're not here but <laughs> If you were in the same auditorium, would stand up and clap. What a tour de force. So happy to be your colleague. So <laughs> proud of you. Honestly, you know, we should make this required reading. My students <laughs> who are watching this, this will be required reading when I teach the graduate class on the app for us and the limits of citizenship. Anyway, over to you, Tanya. We're over time, but I want to give you the last word. Well, thank you so much. And I promise you, <laughs> we didn't rehearse the promotion part of the event. But thank you so much. And again, it's, it's, uh, I'm really touched deeply by, by the response and the support um, for, the, for the work, uh, for the book, and for all your comments, uh, for coming together. Um, and I look forward to more discussions of this type. And um, yeah, thank you again. And I do want to also acknowledge uh, YCAR and the Global Labor Research Center for organizing this, this event and Alicia and Ethel in particular uh, for putting in all the, you know, the time and the energy and all the panelists and everybody for attending. Thank you again. Great. Well, with that said, have a good day, everyone. Congratulations again, Tanya. I will drink a glass of coffee in your honor and <laughs> Goodbye, everyone, and have a good day.